Hello, and uh, welcome to this introduction to RNA sequencing. My name is Marc Guedon. I am a support data analyst at the University of Amsterdam at the Swarm, Swarmerdam Institute of Life Sciences. In this short video, uh, I will give you an introduction to RNA sequencing, and it will provide you with a good idea of all, several things about RNA sequencing, so it, it should serve as an overview of RNA sequencing. So the lesson objectives of this video are to first explain what is RNA sequencing in simple terms, then to give you the main applications of RNA sequencing in biology, outline the types of RNA present in a cell and that you can sequence using this technology, uh, how to differentiate the three generations of DNA sequencing, and explain the opportunities and challenges associated with RNA sequencing. What happened in the last three decades is a post-genomic revolution era. So we first had uh, the genome sequencing of several organisms, especially eukaryotes. So since 1996 and the sequencing of the yeast genome, many eukaryotes have been sequenced. Um, so we had first C. elegans, which is a small worm, in 1998 was quickly followed by Arbidopsis thaliana, the first plant to be sequenced in the 2000, in 2000, and uh, Homo sapiens, so the, the human, in 2003. This, um, this sequencing made it possible to study um, the plant, the organism at several uh, om at several levels, and for that we had omics technologies that came to edge, based on this genome sequencing. So we first had transcriptomics, and this is what the video is about, um, about RNA sequencing. It was also proteomics, so the study of all proteins in an organism, and metabolomics, which uh, measured met metabolites, simple or complex, in a given organism. Finally, the sequencing of genomes also made it possible to model mathematically the functioning of a whole organism since all genes, proteins, and metabolites could be predicted and held together using genome-wide models. So this is the field of modeling and in general, called, this is called systems biology. But today, our interest is focused on RNA sequencing. So let's see a small definition of it. So we can give a quick definition of RNA sequencing in a twofold way. So first, uh, RNA sequencing will focus on RNA in a cell. But we mainly think of RNA as messenger RNA. But in fact, uh, there's relatively little messenger RNA in a cell. And there's a huge diversity of RNA that are present in any given eukaryotic cell. So you'll have to take that into account in uh, when you think about RNA sequencing of these other small and long non-coding RNAs. Secondly, this RNA has to be sequenced. While different sequencing technologies are available, RNA sequencing mainly refers to second generation sequencing technologies that are currently being dominated by Illumina sequencing by synthesis technology. It is also important to keep in mind that DNA is sequenced rather than RNA. Indeed, RNA is turned into DNA that is then amplified before sequencing. Furthermore, only the ends of the sequencing libraries are sequenced. That's why you see it often single end or paired end. More on that in uh, this video. The first part of RNA sequencing consists of sequencing the RNA. But what are we talking about exactly? And why do we want to sequence RNA in the first place? When we talk about RNA-seq, we mostly use this as a short for messenger RNA sequencing. Indeed, according to the central dogma of biology, that states that a phenotype is the result of a genome expression going from DNA to messenger RNA and to protein, it will give us our phenotype. Well, in that case, mRNA can be seen as a proxy for genome activity. You probably know that the genome is transcribed into mRNA by RNA polymerase 2. In eukaryotes, this happens upon promoter binding. You have star and stop codons and exon and introns uh, that are a feature of eukaryotes. This process will yield a primary transcript, also called pre-mRNA. This primary transcript will have to be spliced to get rid of introns. This happens at splice donor and splice acceptor sites. This mRNA will also have a cap, a 5' methylguanine, 
and a poly A tail that are both required for stabilization of this messenger RNA. Finally, upon splicing, the introns will be removed and only the exons will be kept. This mRNA structure has consequences for RNA sequencing since it will determine the ways you can select messenger RNAs from other types of RNA. With mRNA, this mature mRNA is finally translated into proteins by the translational machinery that includes the ribosomes and the transfer RNAs. These mRNAs will be translated into proteins, and these proteins are the key actors of a cell functioning. They can be enzymes that convert some substrates into products, for instance, cleaving sucrose into glucose and fructose. They can also be regulators of genome activity, such as transcription factors, regulating the binding of the RNA polymerase II to the promoter of a gene. They can also be involved in signal transduction, such as kinases, that will uh, be, for example, involved in the perception of a hormone. These mRNA are exported to the cytoplasm for translation, and the protein will then fold, uh, be modified at the post-translational level, uh, be localized, etc., etc. So I'm sorry if this seems to be a little bit too basic, but I wanted to remind you of why someone would like to sequence messenger RNA in the first place. So the main idea is we measure mRNA level to, um, to see which part of the genome is being expressed in a specific tissue or in a specific condition. It really acts as a proxy for the genome activity. But what you have to keep in mind is that the RNA population in a cell is actually much more diverse. So there's also other, um, um, other RNAs that you can find. So for instance, the most abundant RNA in a given cell, in a given eukaryotic cell, uh, are the ribosomal RNAs. So these RNAs are composing the ribosomes together with ribosomal proteins. It is estimated that 80% of all ribosomal RNAs in a cell are ribosomal RNAs. So this ribosome consists of a large and a small subunit, and these large and small subunits are in turn uh, consisting of other RNAs, so 5S, 5.1S, etc., etc. So you will definitely find a myriad of uh, non coding RNA, and especially from the ribosome. Also, um, there are organelles in the cell, so we uh, all cells will have mitochondrial ribosomes as well, and in plants you can also find uh, plastidial ribosomes from the chloroplast, for instance. This ribosome is slightly different, so it has a different uh, weight, 50S and a small subunit, 30S, which originate from an endocymbiosis with cyanobacteria a billion years ago. So you will also find uh, this RNA when you will sequence your RNA. In addition to this ribosomal RNA, we can also find transfer RNAs, which are also quite abundant, and the estimate range around 15% of all RNAs in a given cell are transfer RNAs. So they participate to protein translation by uh, providing a link between the messenger RNA and uh, the amino acid. So it will, they will be involved in the translation of messenger RNA into proteins. More recently, um, RNA sequencing has also be, been used to extensively characterize other classes of RNA. One such class is called the small non conning RNAs, and it consists of uh, subclasses such as small nuclear RNAs that are involved in the nucleo nucleolus. You also have small interfering RNAs and microRNAs that are involved in the regulation of gene expression. Yeah. These small RNAs range between 21 and 24 nucleotides in length for the SE RNA and the mRNAs. And they are, in the case of microRNAs, they are formed in the nucleus, were transcribed by RNA polymerase II. They then form a so called pre mRNA structure like hairpin, which is then processed by dicer proteins into um, a mature microRNA and a star microRNA. And they will regulate the translation of messenger RNA either through cleavage or uh, inhibition of the translation of. 
the MRA into a protein. Even more recently, uh, long non-coding RNA were also found. So these are longer. They range around. Uh, they are longer than 200 nucleotides. They are characterized by the absence of an open reading frame, so they don't code for a protein, and they regulate the gene expression at the DNA of RNA level. So in human, these are estimated to be in the range of 10,000 of transcripts, which is half the number of protein coding genes in human, that is 20,000 genes. So they are also very abundant. It would be a little bit too long to explain all the mechanism in which long non-coding RNAs regulate gene expression, but for instance, one can find that the long non-coding RNAs can alter the translation here, they can also uh, change the splicing of the messenger RNA. Uh, that is, uh, that is the splicing here with the spliceosome. So they will change the type of transcript being produced. Uh, they can also alter the gene expression by adding epigenetic marks on the chromatin, therefore um, changing the expression level of the gene. So all in all. Uh, while most studies will focus on messenger RNA, the possibility to sequence every type of RNA in a given cell has really renewed our perception of the wide range of RNA in, in a given cell. So once, um, according to the central dogma, we had this DNA into mRNA protein phenotype, so a straight line. This was simple, but probably a little bit simplistic. And now what we, uh, what the sequencing approaches have given us is a renewed vision. So we have more like a spaghetti ball where we truly have a cell transcriptomic landscape composed of many different types, mRNAs, small interfering RNAs, transfer RNAs, and so on, which is of course more complex, but also more realistic. And one can now see that the gene expression is fine tuned by a series of actors that include the ribosomes and a myriad of players and it's definitely not straightforward anymore, but it's also definitely more interesting and more realistic. So what is important for you is to isolate the right type of RNA before you do the actual sequencing. So starting from a population of cells, you will extract the total RNA uh, from the cells. You will get a collection of long non cunning RNA, etc. And you will then have to decide on which of this uh, sub, on, a, on which subpopulation you want to uh, you want to study. So you can you could first um, focus on the messenger RNA that are polyethyled. You would you would then perform a poly A selection. You could perhaps be interested in messenger RNA from a bacteria which lives inside an eukaryotic host, and in that case, the messenger RNA would not be polyethyled. In such a case, you would need to perform so-called ribosomal RNA depletion to remove most of the ribosomal RNA, but keep the non poly tailed uh, messenger RNA. You can also size select your RNA to only focus on the small RNAs in your uh, population. Right. Once you have uh, the subpopulation of interest, you will convert it to complementary DNA, cDNA, and start the sequencing process. So this is what we'll see uh, after. At the sequencing technologies um, and a brief history of these and how it changed the landscape in, for the RNA sequencing. It all came historically with uh, Sanger sequencing, which was the first DNA sequencing technology. This method is based on the incorporation of specific nucleotides and the automation of the process further on. So it all starts with a template that you want to sequence and some nucleotides that are going to terminate the reaction. So these nucleotides are D-deoxynucleotides. So it terminates the PCR reaction and you can then know which nucleotide, um, the, you can then know the end nucleotide of the sequence. So this sequence is amplified by PCR and the um, Sanger sequencing was modified to accommodate for fluorescent nucleotides. This means that every time uh, a nucleotide is incorporated, it can be detected with a laser. 
a detector coupled to a computer. And this method enabled the sequencing of the template sequentially. The fluorescence intensity is uh, then detected and the, the higher this fluorescence, the more confident you are in the nucleotide that is being detected. So this Sanger method was heavily used. The sequence is read base by base. This fluorescent intensity, as I said, is linked to the confident in the base call. And this process was automatized in 1987 by the ABI company. And this yielded uh, with around a thousand bases per day. This method was the one used to generate the first complete sequence of a human genome in 2003. This was done by two competing projects done in parallel, one by the National Institute of Health and led by James Watson and one led by the Cetera, by Craig Venter at the Cetera company. Overall, the cost of the human genome of this, um, that first appeared as a draft genome in 2001 was around $300 million and the finished genome sequence in 2003 was uh, yielded an additional $150 million. Uh, so in total, it costed around half a billion dollar and run through a decade, so 10 years. What came as a game changer is a technology called second generation sequencing or more often called next generation sequencing. And this term was coined in relationship with the Sanger sequencing that is in turn often called the first generation sequencing. So it all starts from a genomic DNA or a template DNA, it can be cDNA, which you then fragment. You ligate sequencing adapters, so here in purple. You amplify them by PCR and you then um, add them to a flow cell where each of the, each of the fragments with its sequencing adapter will, will be linked. It will be amplified and it will then do uh, a little bridge that is then further amplified and amplified and again. So this will create clusters of sequences where each base can be called by a laser. So again, you have these fluorescent nucleotides that are being added. And at every cycle, you call a, a base um, that is incorporated sequentially. You can multiplex, so you can have multiple templates sequenced all at once. So this process that generates the cluster is called bridge amplification. Overall, this process is called sequencing by synthesis because you incorporate nucleotides base by base, which in turn reveal the sequence of, uh, of, the, of the initial template. This technology actually led to a sharp drop in sequencing costs. So uh, what you see on this graph are the cost per uh, megabase or per 1 million DNA base across the years. And what you see is that around 2008, there was a sharp drop in the sequencing costs. So usually people compare to um, compare the, um, to Moore's law in terms of speed. So Moore's law describes the, um, the long-term train that the uh, compute power doubles every year. So it's, um, it's already fast. But this decrease in sequencing costs actually went uh, much faster than Moore's law. And that's because in 2008, the NGS technologies, the next generation sequencing technologies were introduced, which resulted in this rapid drop of the cost per megabase. In, uh, regarding the human genome, which is around 2,900 megabase pair, um, while it costed around half a billion uh, in, 2020, in, 20, in the 2000s, early 2000s, it now costs around $1,000. So it all went from half a billion to $1,000 in around 20 years. And for RNA-seq, this amounts to also, <clears throat> this also resulted in a drop in the, in the cost. So what happens is that the Illumina short read technology has actually became the de facto standard for RNA-seq. So Illumina short read technology is also part of the second generation sequencing. And one can see in, in a public repository called the NCBI sequence read archive, but around 90, 95% of all public RNA-seq datasets 
were produced by uh, the Illumina sequencing technology. So this mature technology has now cars that compete with quantitative PCR, qPCR, um, with costs ranging for one sample to around $150. Sequencing is very dynamic. Recent advances are called per-generation sequencing, and they generate long reads in the range of hundreds to thousands kilobases. Two major technologies are dominant in the field. The first is the one from PacBio called Single Molecule Real-Time Sequencing or Smart Sequencing. This technology happens in real time and it starts from a circular DNA template that goes into a tiny well called a zero-mode waveguide. In this tiny well, a polymerase is immobilized at the bottom. It will bind to the adapter in green here and will start replicating the DNA template. Every time a fluorescent nucleotide is added, it will trigger a light pulse related to the nucleotide being incorporated. This will generate long reads from 1 kilobase to 50 kilobase, that is 50,000 uh, base pairs. So that means that sequencing of full-length messenger RNA is possible in one single, uh, in single mode. So uh, it is also very accurate. You can get 99% base accuracy in the circular mode. And what you see here in this little sketch is the zero mode waveguide where uh, light, uh, you give excitation with a laser and you detect the um, incorporated nucleotide in real time. And depending on the nucleotide being incorporated, you get a different uh, pulse corresponding to a cytosine or an adenosine. The second technology is the Oxford nanopore. So Oxford nanopore uses tiny protein pores fixed on an electrically resistant membrane. Every time a DNA molecule enters a pore, the electrical current will change. So the current that uh, is detected is related to the nucleotide passing the pore at a precise moment. So here in this little sketch, you have a DNA molecule passing through the pore and you can see that the electrical current changes and is related to the uh, nucleotide being, uh, being detected, so a T, a C, etc. This also generate long to even very long reads, so you can go, uh, the current record is approximately 2 million base pair. You can also detect epigenetic modifications of DNA or RNA, uh, without having to prepare a specific library. So you can detect epigenetic modifications of DNA, for instance, or RNA edits where um, one nucleotide is replaced by another. Now that we have seen how to perform sequencing, let's see the advantages of RNA-seq and the challenges associated to it. So, RNA-seq is characterized by a high dynamic range because it can detect low to highly expressed genes. It is also more specific than probes since it sequences the actual sequence of the mRNAs. So on this graph, you can see a comparison between RNA-seq intensities and the one from microarrays, which is a technology used previously to detect genes. And what you can see is that Genes from a microarray in the in the high range, the highly expressed genes, are both well detected by RNA-seq and microarrays. But when it comes to lowly expressed genes, the intensities for the microarray are actually very much the same. Whereas for RNA-seq, you can see a larger dynamic range. RNA-seq has also a big advantage: is that you don't necessarily need need a reference genome. Indeed, you can perform an RNA-seq analysis without a genome, and this is called de novo gene assembly. For instance, you can use a software called Trinity to do that, that assembles uh, RNA-seq reads into contigs, clusters, and transcripts. The Trinity software starts with RNA-seq reads, put them into contigs through a process called inchworm, cluster these contigs into components, into clusters and then 
will assemble the reads into transcript isoforms. And this can be useful to detect, for example, alternative splicing. We can also use RNA-seq to refine a genome annotation. Indeed, third generation sequencing produces long reads that can improve genome annotation even from well-characterized model species such as Arvidopsis. In a recent paper, they compared two annotations from Arvidopsis, the previous one called TER10, with a new one called RPORT11. And even for well-characterized genes, one can see that many splicing variants can be discovered with UTRs, exons, and introns arranged in different ways. Of course, there are also challenges associated with RNA-seq. While the cost was initially too high, they have become much cheaper, but still amounts to several thousand euros. But the cost of RNA-seq is decreasing, while the data output that you get from an experiment is increasing, especially in terms of number and length of reads. Perhaps one of the challenges is the amount of data generated from one single RNA-seq experiment. It can quickly sum up to dozens of gig gigabytes. Also, this data cannot be directly used, but rather has to be converted, quality checked, etc. This relates to the last and perhaps most important challenge. Uh, specific skills are required for RNA-seq data analysis in particular uh, in bioinformatics, to go from a sequencing file in FASQ format to a matrix of gene counts as a CSV format. Also, one needs to learn some statistical and programming skills to be able to perform the post bioinformatics steps, for example, to perform differential expression or explore the gene counts, convert um, gene identifiers with databases, etc., etc. Let's now see the applications of RNA-seq in the life sciences. Now that we have a clear idea of what is RNA sequencing, its advantages and challenges, let's see how it can be applied in biology. A big part of the interest in RNA-seq um, deals with gene functions inside the cell. This domain is called functional genomics. So for example, you can ask what is a particular gene involved in? It can be involved in signal transduction, the enzymatic conversion of a metabolite, and one method to assign a function to a gene is to study its regulation in response to a particular treatment, such as an external hormone applied in the growth medium, for instance. One can also mutate a gene and monitor the mutation effect on other genes. Similarly to a detective, a gene affected by a treatment compared to a control condition is likely to be involved in the adaptation of the cell to the treatment. Another important use case of RNA-seq is the ability to find marker genes related to a specific tissue or developmental stage. The transcriptome is dynamic over time and space, and not all genes are expressed at the same time. This provides the organism with a collection of genes co-expressed in time and space, and there are nowadays numerous online resources based on multiple RNA-seq experiments that offer an easy way to access to this knowledge. We will see an example based on human. Finally, while genome sequences piled up rapidly, half of the battle is to annotate genes to provide a catalog of genes, their structure, five prime UTRs, introns, exons, etc. And RNA-seq has become essential in the process of genome annotation, even for well annotated model species. One example of an RNA-seq application for functional genomics is provided here. It deals with a response of yeast cells exposed to different concentrations of acetic acid in their culture medium. When a culture of yeast cells is exposed to acetic acid, the number of yeast cells gradually decrease, as it can be seen on this graph. So the acetic acid will decrease the yeast cell viability. Furthermore, Acetic acid also affects the cell membrane. Here we have a control condition. Here we have uh, the membranes after 45 minutes of exposure to acetic acid or 120 minutes after exposition. And it will sort of shamble the yeast cell membrane. So the question becomes, what are the biological processes triggered by acetic acid? 
in these yeast cells. In particular, a researcher might be interested to find the genes that are responding to this uh, chemical in the medium. So we can think about an experiment, an RNA-seq experiment, to discover these genes. So let's see two conditions, the control and uh, after 45 minutes of exposure to acetic acid, the yeast cells will be collected. The total RNA will be isolated. The poly A um, only the messenger RNA will be purified, fragmented, reverse transcribed to cDNA. Sequencing adapters will then be added to the cDNAs amplified by PCR and subjected to RNA sequencing. This will yield reads, let's say short reads of, for instance, 100 nucleotide. This information will be processed by bioinformatics. This will give, um, and this will give a list, um, sorry, this gene expression, gene expression will be evaluated by counting how many reads will align to genes and differential genes will be called. So this workflow is the canonical workflow and the most frequent you will find uh, online or in publications. So this process will yield a list of genes that are affected in relation to the biological treatment. From all these genes, a statistical test is performed on each of them and a volcano plot can be, can be created. So this plot is called a volcano plot due to its shape. It looks like a volcano eruption. And here we have the comparison between 45 minutes of treatment with acetic acid versus the control condition. We have genes on the right, genes on the left. So the genes on the right will have a positive log to fold change. So these genes will be upregulated in response to acetic acid. On the other hand, genes on the left hand side will have a negative log to fold change, which means they are downregulated by acetic acid. On the y-axis, we have the p the adjusted p-value plotted on an inverted log 10 scale, so that p-values, which range from uh, 1 to very small, are plotted on a positive scale from 0 to 15 here, so on a, on, on a scale you can read. So given a selected log to fold chain threshold of for instance, two, you can, you can find differential genes. So here in the study, 893 genes were coined differentially expressed genes based on a false change threshold of two. So that can be plus two or minus two and an adjusted p-value threshold uh, lower than 0.05. So the number of genes you consider differentially expressed is a function of your selected log to fold change and the adjusted p-value threshold that you choose. ATLAS, which is a comprehensive catalog of gene expression across tissues and developmental stages. The example here comes from a massive database from human tissues. Each human tissue had its transcriptome assessed by RNA-seq. Many tools are available from this database. So we collected different tissues and on each of them, a researcher can be interested to search for some expressed genes in a particular tissue. Say you want to search for the most expressed genes from brain tissues. So here you can search for these genes. The most expressed genes are shown. Oh, sorry. The most expressed genes are shown in dark blue, so in this color. You have also um, they are all these top 50 genes are listed uh, on a heat map, so false colored uh, matrix. So each cell represents the value of, of a gene in a particular tissue and sample. On the, on the high part of the heat map, you have a cluster grouping the different tissues together. So the brain tissues are actually listed here together in, in yellow. What you have uh, at the lower, on the lower part are all the different tissues. So the, the brain tissues again are in yellow here. Uh, what else do we have? Um, we can see that a group of genes, these ones in particular, are separating the brain tissues in yellow from the others. And if you would like to find, to select one gene, let's say PLP1, 
we can then uh, click on the gene and it will show the expression in, in a different panel like this one. So you've selected one gene among the top 50 genes expressed in the brain. Here on the y-axis you have a transcript per million, so that relates to the abundance of that gene. And here you have all the different tissues. And what you can see is that this gene is highly expressed uh, in the spinal cord, a little bit more than the hypothalamus, for example. So you have um, a whole an helicopter view of the expression of that gene in all tissues from one organism. And that can be very useful. What you also find this database is that you can also visualize the expression of individual transcript isoforms, potentially showing which exons are more expressed in a particular tissue. So here you, you see that the seven last exons of, uh, of this gene are actually the most expressed in the brain tissues. Because sometimes some splicing isoforms will be more expressed than others depending on the tissue and time and etc. And that can also be uh, useful to, uh, to see. This sort of expression database are not restricted to human, of course, and you can find it in different organisms. In this example, um, we can see the ePlan resource that contains data from the model plan Arbidopsis. So you can search for your favorite gene, let's say ABI3, so it has a gene number, which then you can see the, um, the expression of the gene in relation to the plan genotype, the developmental stage, uh, the, the tissues during development, uh, also the cell localization, and you also have other um, types of information, so the location of the gene on the chromosome, the folding of the protein, etc. So it's a very comprehensive resource when you want to study a gene of interest. Thank you. I've listed a few key references uh, related to RNA-seq that you can find here. I'll put the links also at the bottom of the video so you can uh, follow the links. Thank you for your attention.